good afternoon to everyone i welcome all of you to the 98th lecture in the lecture series in nonlinear dynamics conducted by the department of nonlinear dynamics bharati dasan university with the support from rusa 2.0 it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker professor jayant patarji professor patarji did his masters in physics from calcutta university india 1975 and carried out his phd in university of maryland usa in the year 1979 he did his postdoctoral studies in institute of theoretical physics university of california santa barbara usa and also in the university of maryland college park usa for it for a year each in 1981 and he continued his postdoctoral research in iff der kfa germany for a year he started his teaching career in iit kanpur and has served various high profile institutes of our country such as indian association for the cultivation of sciences kolkata sn bose national center for basic sciences kolkata harish chandra research institute alagabad iit kharagpur and he is currently working as a distinguished visiting professor in indian association for the cultivation of sciences from the year 2017 he is the fellow of national academy of sciences since 1997 and also indian academy of sciences from the year 1999 he received aps iuss tf professorship award in the year 2016 professor patarji has several notable publications in his area of expertise he has given several lectures and talks in many conferences across the world he has research collaborations with the top universities not only in india but also in in international level during his career he has guided 24 phd theses and he has mentored many postdoctoral fellows he has written seven books and he has authored more than 290 publications in peer reviewed international journals and he has a h index of 31 with this short introduction now i invite professor batterji to deliver his lecture over to you professor Right. Thank you very much, brother Santosh Manan. Um, we uh, what we are going to do today is uh, talk about uh, patterns, which all of you are familiar with, uh, and the point that I want to make about the patterns is that patterns are always an outcome of conflicts. That is going to be my um, uh, basic theme. The what 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 is meant by a pattern? pattern is something which repeats uh the the simplest thing is when it repeats regularly so it is characterized by a single scale if it is a pattern in space then it is a spatial scale if it's a pattern in time it is a time scale the pattern in time all of us have to live with it every day that is summer comes back after 365 days so does the winter and so on so that has to do with this uh, um, uh, the rotation of the earth around the um, uh, sun and what did that so this 365 days what gave rise to it what gave rise to it was this question of a um, uh, conflict between the for at the time of formation when the earth as a sort of splinter object from some other large celestial mass was shooting away with a initial velocity and if there were no other forces it would have just gone off somewhere or other but there was the sun with its gravitational attraction and so it was a tussle between the sun's pull and the earth's desire to keep its own velocity the result was that the sun tries to pull it in earth tries to move in its own direction and the pull and the desire to move and the same path turns the path around and then brings in back brings it back to where it started and so we have this um, almost circular pattern around the sun elliptic 
in uh, reality. So going around the sun, balance between the Earth's inertia and the sun's gravitational attraction in a, such a manner that this balance always stays and this balance always stays if the time scale is 365 days. So that is the um, uh, 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 motive behind the motive behind the talk that there would be two agencies involved. Over here is the sun's uh, Earth's desire to move according to Newton's first law just follow its own velocity with which it detached itself from some mass or other. And then there is the sun trying to pull it back from its um, uh, desire to move uh, along its own trajectory. So that is the conflict. And that is what we will be talking about. So as I said, patterns are always characterized by at least one length or time scale that is a spatial or temporal pattern, will concentrate on one length scale situations. Um, uh, what we would be excluding uh, is the world of, um, uh, for example, the two incommensurate length scales, which uh, you can see on the um, skin of a pineapple, for example. And as I said, that the scale will always emerge as a result of a tussle between two um, uh, competing effects. And we'll always see that there is some kind of a uniform steady state which nature might have preferred. And the competition is maintain it or destabilize. And uh, patterns are almost always formed through an instability. And that is where the role of nonlinear dynamics comes in. So I'll quickly go over some basic uh, forces and uh, um, uh, situations one would be encountering. Here is surface tension. The um, uh, molecules, so this is a liquid surface over here, and the molecules on the surface feel a net force to a, which keeps them sort of keeps the surface tight. And uh, that is the um, uh, uh, surface tension, which the, uh, essentially pulls these surface molecules towards the interior of the liquid. And uh, that is one thing which we will be talking about. Uh, the same, the effect of the surface tension, uh, a pin can float on a liquid that's more on surface tension. This is the needle and how it, and here is um, the uh, gravity or zero gravity. And you can see in zero gravity, uh, Captain Haddock's um, uh, whiskey has come out and formed a perfect sphere, which is entirely now surface tension dominated. The, if there is no surface tension, uh, if there is no other forces and only a surface tension, a liquid drop assumes a spherical shape. But when there are other forces, for example, Earth's gravity, you don't see a nice um, um, uh, sphere, but you see that um, uh, it is somewhat flattened. Uh, if you look at a uh, dewdrop falling, or a teardrop falling, you will see that it's spherical, but once it is settled on the floor, it is no longer uh, spherical. So the more of, so the next thing we'll talk about, one, one the next thing we'll need is the question of convection, uh, conduction. So heat transported without any movement of the material from one end to the other is conduction. If it is transported by actual movement, then it is convection. And radiation is, as you see it, the fire burning and the heat um, uh, coming out. We'll skip these. Here is convection. Uh, convection currents that is associated with these mantles and so on and so forth, which are meant in by convection. Here is diffusion. You drop um, um, uh, a, a ink drop 
in this uh, uh, left-hand uh, beaker over here, and um, that uh, gradually it starts diffuse the uh, molecules in the uh, ink drop start moving through the water and spreading out and eventually it is all spread out and that movement of those drops of ink inside this large bath of water molecules is this process of diffusion diffusion once again high concentration to low concentration which is what was happening the drop was concentrated and then it had to sort of diffuse out and become uniform at the end in the previous picture and now comes a practical situation which we want to discuss here is a famous asian paints ad this kid uh, dips his um, uh, a brush in uh, paint and then gives a swipe on the wall. And the red Asian paints, this is the yellow is the wall, the red is the paints, and the paint comes down. It comes down not along a straight line just coming down. It forms this uneven surface, the interface boundary between the paint and the air over here is a rather rough boundary characterized by a certain length scale. And the question is that what is the can one get the length scale that one is seeing over there. So that is the first problem that we will try to attack quantitatively, that we know this pattern has been formed because there is gravity, which would just like the red paint, which is heavier, to simply come down. But as it tries to come down, surface tension gets into the um, uh, picture and the uh, flat surface is no, uh, not uh, the uh, stable one. It, the, uh, there are local uh, pushes and pulls and the surface tension um, uh, gets this, uh, and, uh, uh, gives rise to this surface tension effects, give rise, gives rise to this new equilibrium uh, boundary. So, well, there is the um, uh, flat interface with uh, of the heavier one. The paint is heavier than air, and you have the heavier one of on the top, and it is potentially unstable. So, gravity would like the heavier one to descend, but <clears throat> it is uh, the thing is incompressible. So, the thing is incompressible. So, you just can't simply descend. So the lighter fluid would have to find some way um, uh, to go to the top. But then the interface becomes wavy. And this is what is not the um, uh, in, uh, surface to the surface tensions liking because the area has, uh, has become bigger, whereas surface tension would like the area to be the smallest possible, which is why in the absence of gravity, that uh, teardrop is a perfect sphere. So you have gravity, which wants the heavier liquid to come down, heavier liquid to come down, it just can't simply come down because the uh, incompressibility condition uh, would, lie, would allow the lighter liquid to find a path to go up. Lighter liquid going up forms these um, uh, 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 sort of disconnected bits and surface tension does not like that and would like to sort of reduce them as much as possible. And the compromise is the pattern that you see. And then we can actually do some calculation. You calculate here is your a little bit of the surface showing a wiggle. The, uh, it's a, a red paint on top and the yellow um, uh, wall um, uh, surface below. And uh, what you do is uh, you calculate the gravitational potential energy and you calculate the surface energy. So that comes from the surface tension, the gravitational potential energy just from the 
uh, calculation of the weight of the column. And the point is that they would have to come to a compromise. So the compromise is when they become uh, equal and that equality forces the wavelength, the wave vector K, which is 2 pi over lambda. So this K is given by this quantity over here, and that is the inverse of the wavelength. So the wave, this is the inverse of the uh, uh, wavelength. K needs to be uh, smaller um, uh, than uh, this quantity over here. So the wavelength, which is the inverse, needs to be um, uh, larger than the uh, inverse. So um, uh, that so this is the scale. The bottom line is that this is the characteristic scale. K there is 1 over L. So L is S over delta rho times G to the power half. And those turns which you saw on that uh, slide over there. So these turns over here. So the length scale that I'm talking about is the width of this turn over here. That is the length scale. And that length scale is what we are told is obtained by a balance and is given by the inverse of this uh, quantity over here. And then you ask that, uh, does it work? And uh, the answer is that it uh, works very well. So you can easily get within 10% by this calculation, which is uh, um, uh, extremely crude. You can get the uh, scale, uh, correct scale within 10% with no difficulty at all. So that's the first example that we had. This is once again more of the same heavier liquid coming down into a lighter liquid and you see the kind of patterns that get formed as it sort of tries to come in and uh, um, to uh, uh, surface tension which does not like the increased surface area is trying its best to sort of get rid of it. So surface tension fighting with and now the change um, uh, 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 but once again, you must have seen this pattern um, uh, on a, um, a, a fry pan if the water has a fry pan with spices and water when if the water manages to evaporate, you are careless. The spices for the spice powder forms a pattern like this. You see it on when the dust follow a similar kind of pattern on a hot road after there has been. And what it is, is a convection pattern. In a, on a hot road, the water, uh, the rains have come and the water um, uh, is, the water that collects on the um, uh, pavement, sl small layer of water, but it is hot when it where it touches the um, uh, pavement and cooler above. And so there is a hot fluid rising and hot fluid rising and the cold coming down is the convection and it follows this circular patterns and leaves this track on the road or on your in your skillet uh, if you have been careless in cooking. So, um, I mean, here is uh, the uh, not quite perfect hexagons everywhere. There can be some uh, uh, defects in this pattern. The defects come that will tell you that there is an unevenness in the, um, if this was a, in your fry pan and there was a nice um, regularity over most of it and a small irregularity here, you could uh, immediately conclude that uh, although the, uh, your pan looks flat, to the eye, if you look at it uh, with a microscope, there would be a, a, a small uh, change in level uh, somewhere. So, um, uh, as I said, dust on it. So, what 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 kind of a force balance are we um, uh, talking about over here? It is a question of buoyancy against the 
resistive force. So it is the buoyancy which causes this to rise. So here is here on your right in this force balance thing, there is the buoyancy driven by the delta T. It's hot over here and um, uh, cold over there at the top. And the delta, this means that it is a lighter fluid at the bottom and heavier fluid above. So the heavier fluid falls and the lighter fluid rises. And that is, that's because of the buoyancy force. And that is the buoyancy force that um, uh, you see. And this motion, as soon as there is this buoyancy driven motion, uh, there is going to be viscous, uh, viscosity coming into play to stop it. And here is the um, uh, viscous force over here. So that's the <coughs> force balance <coughs> from which you can get the velocity. And from that, you can get the rising time. So this is the time to rise for this hot air to go over there. But then if the this effect would disappear, if heat which diffuses manages to diffuse from the high temperature to the low temperature, and then you wouldn't see this pattern. So there you have to know what the diffusing time is. The diffusing time is given by this depth D over here. D is the um, uh, dif uh, distance between the blue and uh, red lines, the top and bottom of the container here. And uh, the <clears throat> so the heat diffusing time is D squared, D over there, uh, divided by the heat diffusion, the thermal conductivity, and D squared over lambda is the heat diffusing time. If the heat diffuser is slow, that is that time is going to be longer if it takes long then the bottom will remain hot and if that time scale is greater than this time scale then you are going to have an instability and that is the instability that you see over here that this is this dimensionless quantity which is known as the Rayleigh number has to be greater than one so this is a convective instability which you see in a fluid when um, uh, it is uh, an, uh, subjected to an adverse temperature gradient that is cold above and hot below. All right, these uh, the uh, convection cells which are formed over here are generally uh, um, are stationary uh, in time. They don't change. They don't. They just keep their form where they have uh, it's a stationary pattern that is seen primarily hexagonal hexagonal is the favorite pattern once again and you see a, fav a favorite uh, hexagonal pattern when you look at it from a steady hexagonal pattern if you look at the fluid layer from above if instead of a fluid a uh, single fluid over here if i had a fluid mixture or, all right, that is what you see. I mean, here is convection uh, cell um, uh, formed in the clouds. As you can see, this is what I'm, uh, I was talking about. What forms in the kitchen um, uh, over there when you heat the um, heat of fluid from below is exactly what is being seen in the cloud over here, which is hotter below and cooler above. So all right, but uh, suppose I were if I were to add a complication can be thrown in if it was a mixture of fluids or a mixture of salt and water, then the stationary pattern that I said that the pattern that you see this pattern for example does would not change with time, but if I have a uh, mixture of fluid and maintain that adverse gradient, then it is possible that this, um, uh, 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 if I set the parameters right, then the onset can also become oscillatory. That is, the pattern changes form with time 
changes from one shape to another and then changes back again and again. This process goes on and that is what is an oscillatory process. So long ago, we um, uh, envisaged that if one um, uh, modulates that the temperature gradient, that is, if I have a gradient of 10 degrees centigrade, I change it so that at sometimes it's eight and sometimes it's 12. I do this with a certain regular frequency. Then we co it um, uh, uh, because there is a frequency in the convection pattern as well, we could induce a resonance and get a large response. This was with uh, um, uh, in my early IIT days with a friend and colleague, uh, Kalyan uh, Banerjee, who is no more actually. And uh, anyway, so we thought we have seen uh, the, and now uh, we thought that we would be seeing a nice spatiotemporal pattern. So spatiotemporal because uh, the spatial pattern we have already talked about, convection like uh, these uh, hexagonal cells and so on and so forth. And then these are sort of switching with time. So you have a spatiotemporal pattern and we thought it would be some kind of a standing wave. Uh, the spatiotemporal part was um, obviously easy. And uh, uh, but the, when finally the dust settled through experiments and so on, which was a uh, few years down the line, uh, it turned out that it was a traveling wave and not a standing wave. And uh, obviously, that was we had missed that uh, uh, possibility because the traveling wave is uh, rather unusual. Getting a large response, all right, I mean, that is. Um, uh, uh, easy to uh, figure out in some ways. Uh, but then the fact that um, uh, we had missed the point that there was the possibility of a uh, um, traveling wave as opposed to the uh, time dependent response immediately um, uh, sort of led us to a standing wave. Um, uh, this was long before actually the uh, pattern uh, uh, diffusion driven patterns became popular, which are very popular now. So now shift to that kind of pattern. Um, and the cheetah, so um, uh, uh, which is uh, on the uh, uh, in, in the news in India now. The zebra. Reaction diffusion systems. So you have two diffusive, I mean, at least two. One can go and make it more. You want two diffusive and chemically interactive species. One is called an activator and the other is an innovator. Now, what's an activator? Well, what, I mean, the name tells you what you should expect that it is autocatalytic, it can sort of self-generate, but what is more important, it also produces the inhibitor. So this activator manages to multiply by itself, but also produces an inhibitor, which in turn inhibits the autocatalysis. Then both of these can diffuse through the liquid environment in which they generally always live. These, uh, then it is uh, uh, the inhibitor which diffuses, uh, suppose the inhibitor diffuses much faster than the activator. Now a fluctuation in the activator concentration can lead to a stable pattern, which is called a Turing pattern. So the setup is this, that you have two diffusive and chemically interactive species. There is an activator, which is autocatalytic, which produces an inhibitor, which 
actually tries to stop the autocatalysis. And the inhibitor, both the inhibitor and uh, the um, activator, uh, li live in a, a fluid medium through which they can diffuse, and the inhibitor diffuses much faster than the activator. So that is the setup. And so uh, you want to try and uh, write down you, uh, uh, what's going on. So you have two species, A and B, diffusing on a substrate. A diffuses slowly, is autocatalytic, and promotes the growth of B. B diffuses fast, is antagonistic to A, and that is the way B conducts its life. It can diffuse fast and is antagonistic to A. A diffuses slowly, is autocatalytic, that is, can grow by itself, but also promotes the growth of B, which tries to kill it. So let's say I have a uniform background of this A's and B's, and I make a perturbation. So I have this perturbation where, let's say, I have an alternating A, B, A, B, A, B, and so on. This pattern is going to stay because the A diffuses slowly and produces itself and also produces the B. And B can diffuse fast and is antagonistic to A. So A, it is not possible for A to sort of bypass B or overtake B and come to this side. So A is stuck where it was, B stays where it is, and the next day once again, and this pattern is going to be a stable pattern. The situation of two chemical species, A and B, one diffusing slowly, well, and autocatalytic and promotes the growth of a, an enemy, and the enemy diffuses fast and is an enemy uh, to A. So this combination can, if you try to think, if you just think about it, can possibly lead to a pattern. And with this idea, Turing, I mean, uh, this was the Turing argument in some, uh, I mean, in a much more uh, difficult way, people figured it out over uh, many decades, what Turing was after, and what I told you is the uh, dilute version. But uh, here it is, that um, uh, 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 this model with the A and B, a, uh, uh, here is uh, the diffusing part, uh, the d times uh, del square a, and here uh, d is set equal to 1, so b do, a dot equal to del, d del square a, b dot equal to del square b. So <clears throat> now here is a dot, I mean, if you leave everything to itself, then uh, it is um, uh, going to decay, but then a dot has a spontaneous growth, and that's your sigma, so that's the sigma growth. And then there is the a square over b, a tries to grow is autocatalytic, so it tries to grow with this a square thing, but then the b tries to cut it down, and so the a square is reduced by the concentration of b, and you have this um, uh, uh, term, antagonistic term, trying to cut down on the autocatalytic effect. Autocatalytic is A square, cut down by the antagonistic B. Here is the uh, growth by itself, so the spontaneous growth rate, and this, the normal decay, what uh, happens to everyone, it, uh, they die. So A dot equal to minus A. B dot, once again, the diffusion, and a minus b, b has to die, but it is growing out of the help of a, so it is its growth is driven by a squared. So this is the dynamical uh, uh, setup. And now what you do, you look for a 
spatially uniform fixed point and um, uh, you um, uh, study the uh, perturbation around the fixed point, uh, whether it is uh, stable against uniform disturbance, whether it is stable against periodic disturbance. If it is unstable against a periodic disturbance, then a periodic pattern is going to emerge. And so you do all the standard calculations that a nonlinear dynamics course teaches you to do, and you get a, a whole variety of interesting things. So that's the um, uh, way things go. An interesting part of this would be uh, when the spatial and temporal um, uh, patterns interact. So we pick up a phenomenon which, which is an, uh, glycolysis. And a glycolysis is something in which uh, uh, sugar, that is glucose, broken down by enzymes to um, and uh, the energy that is ex uh, some energy is extracted for cellular uh, metabolism and so on. But, but that I, I, I'm quite ignorant about what it is. But observation is that under certain conditions, the rate at which the products of glycolysis accumulate show oscillations in time. Although the rate at which sugar is supplied is constant. That is, this uh, sugar, which you, glucose, which you had, you had some, uh, 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 supplying sugar at a regular rate, but the products of this process show an oscillation. So, Kumar, can you? So, yes. can you unmute? Please mute your. So, <clears throat> so, so we have. Yes, sorry, sir. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's all right. So we have this uh, interesting situation here where this glycolysis process is occurring, where the sugar, which is that is glucose, broken down by enzymes to extract energy. The rate at which you are supplying the sugar is constant, but the product seems to oscillate in time. The, and so uh, this had to be understood. And the person who wrote down a model for this uh, was Selkov. And here is um, Selkov's model. Uh, there is the a ADP, and which has a concentration of rho 1. And there is fruct Oh, uh, what did you want? I, I mean, repeat it. Uh, yeah, from this we didn't hear, sir. Oh, you didn't hear from here? Yeah, yeah that is the problem, sir. <laughs> oh, oh. Oh, 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 I, I see. Oh. Okay. All right. So uh, the uh, point, point with this is that uh, there was this model for um, uh, uh, the uh, gl glycolysis. And uh, the, uh, all right, there was a question of um, the, um, uh, uh, oh, two chemicals. So interacting with each other, and there is a model which, uh, when we um, uh, solve, uh, it is. I mean, the one of Strogatz worked out uh, 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 cases. Uh, what you see is that there is uh, there are two parameters in the problem, A and B, and if you plot A against B. There is a curve, closed curve in the AB space, which demarcates the oscillatory region from the uh, uh, state, uh, the um, no pattern, uh, 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 the uh, uh, steady state. So the steady state and the oscillatory region are separated by a closed curve in the parameter space. Given this now, what we uh, did was what we thought that if I have a whole region 
which is hop like separated from a whole region uh, which is uh, um, uh, standard uh, bifurcation uh, then if we add diffusion if we allow the um, chemicals to diffuse then the pattern forming instability which is bound to happen would have an interesting uh, competition with the hop so the pattern forming which is always a saddle um, and with no diffusion, it's a hop. And there was this question of the hop bifurcation uh, and, and the saddle coexisting, which you can see in this picture. It gives rise to a wide variety of effects. On, I mean, this is these are the two parameters A and B of the Selkov model, which is without and this curve that you see over here is the Selkov curve where the hop is inside and the uh, standard pattern is outside. And the um, uh, thing is that uh, now that we have this diffusion put in, you can see this various values of diffusion. If diffusion is large, then the saddle line looks like this. If the diffusion is small, then it looks like this. And then there is a critical value where it sort of follows this curve over here and intersects the um, uh, uh, separating the uh, uh, region into two parts with uh, pattern and no pattern and uh, giving rise to a hop line and uh, um, uh, line or pattern line intersecting, producing a set of co-dimension to bifurcation, uh, a co-dimension co to point of bifurca point bifurcation over here, where you have essentially uh, um, a region where the um, hop and the uh, react uh, the pattern, uh, the spatial pattern and the temp uh, temporal pattern coexist and can give rise to different kinds of time dependent and spatial structure. So this is, I mean, all right. Um, uh, what um, uh, the, I mean, what is what, what's the take home? The point is that. I mean, these models are so artificial and so on and so forth that you don't expect that you would see each and every um, uh, uh, small point of this. But what I guess is uh, why these things are um, worth studying is that some features may be robust. Over here, uh, my uh, feeling is that if we have a uh, Hopf um, uh, curve, and we have a reaction diffusion curve, then there could be some overlapping region in the phase space where these um, uh, uh, two effects would interact with each other. And there can be spatiotemporal patterns, which are rather um, uh, quite, quite, quite nice, and if one could, uh, in an experiment, pick them up, it could lead to give us patterns which one have, may not have expected. So that is where I see the um, uh, utility of this, what essentially looks like, I mean, playing around, but maybe, I mean, there are some positive things to uh, say about it. The other kind, which is similar to what we had done, is something which uh, Mala Banerjee and his students did in IIT Kanpur, um, which was with a predator-prey system, and they added complications to the Lotka-Volterra model. They started with the nonlinear Lotka-Volterra, and then allowed the species, the rabbits and the foxes, to diffuse. Diffuse meaning essentially uh, they allow the rabbits and foxes to wander around randomly looking for ways in which to increase their uh, population. And uh, one at the expense of other and so on. Uh, and so you can you sort of drift and 
maybe it is not a uh, totally random drift but or as a starter you can add a diffusion and look at it and then you uh, look for um, what uh, can be uh, some uh, motivation uh, which you can uh, uh, and add in the you can put in as a hunting tactics so you can take the uh, um, uh, rabbit fox interaction term and make the coefficient a little complicated dependent on the population number and so on uh, to add a different kind of nonlinearity to add a uh, uh, possibly more refined um, uh, mod, uh, to get a more refined model and so it is uh, all right and interesting which uh, uh, as um, uh, things are uh, the more studies along those lines and so on and eventually there could be uh, uh, but uh, this is again uh, inter uh, interesting uh, piece of work which uh, I thought was uh, worth talking about. And then there is the question of star formation, uh, which is a, um, a, a competition between the internal pressure of the gas in the star and the gravitational pressure. When they are balanced, it's hydrostatic equilibrium. The pressure gradient is the uh, gravitational force. And then you look at um, when does this equilibrium um, uh, break down? So, uh, uh, yeah, and the, maybe the gravity wins and um, uh, the star is going to collapse. So, well, uh, will it, will the gravity win and what now how do you uh, what how big has the mass got to be uh, before gravity wins so you look for time scales a time over which the collapse occurs and also um, uh, the uh, what prevents the collapse when the collapse begins the pressure waves are set up so these are sound waves which alert the inside layers to something is happening and you should take action. So uh, if they can restore the uh, pressure balance, then things would be all right. If not, so it is a competition between the sound crossing time, that is sound being uh, passed on, sound is the... Uh, information passage from the upper layers which are feeling the pressure to the lower layers inside to uh, set up a device to counter the pressure so if these two time scales uh, the uh, if the collapse time is faster shorter time then it will be collapse and that is the mechanism by which one calc uh, the genes length was calculated by uh, Sir James Jeans. And I mean, that's once again, a kind of problem that I have been uh, uh, talking about. And so this is the characteristic scale of a galaxy. And so finally, I mean, the uh, uh, question, this is a, a lab experiment in ISI Kolkata, uh, where a fast flowing fluid was coming in from the left and at some point it sort of kicks up and the speed is diminished and it moves with a high uh, uh, with a greater thickness slowly to the right the jump that you see occurring in this region is called a hydraulic jump and you see it in many settings this water coming down a channel a uh, height difference over there as well uh, between the lower channel over here and the upper source over here and then more uh, importantly in your kitchen sink so this is something that all of us can do you just switch on the water and what you would find is this uh, water falls and just goes out and creates this ring of water this is my kitchen sink so all of you can actually um, uh, do it so you see the wall being formed over here it is smooth where the in this region where the water is flowing out fast and then it is all very uh, um, uh, sort of uh, wriggly uh, when the water is flowing out slow 
so uh, once again in the tide coming in that's the uh, so what's the what's going on what is going on is an uh, interesting competition the fluid is being as it moves out is slowed down by viscous action and the information uh, about the state of the fluid with at what speed it is traveling the up other layers behind uh, uh, and the layers in front have to be in touch about the state of the motion and that is through the information which is sent via the uh, surface gravity waves so if fluid travels at a high speed this surface gravity this information is lost and therefore the fluid behind comes rushing without knowing that there is a slower moving body in front you see I, I mean the fluid over here is rushing along it doesn't know that there is a slower moving body here and then when it comes here it has to jump up because all of a sudden it collides and there is a, a jump in the level so that is the phenomenon and this sharp boundary um, uh, was uh, in, is a, a boundary of uh, uh, competition between the propagation of information and spreading out of the fluid. So uh, the um, uh, it's uh, so it's information. Information uh, sounds like black holes and white holes, and therefore. If you the, there was this interest that if you try to do this fluid mechanics, then would it look like uh, would it give rise to a metric which sort of looks like a Schwarzschild metric? And the answer was that it does, and uh, the uh, there is a radius which corresponds to the radius of the jump, and the math sort of follows. But that radius can also be obtained from a very simple argument the um, as the fluid is flowing the velocity square if the uh, at any radius r if the height of the fluid layer is h then uh, the v square is equal to gh so that is that's what um, uh, uh, defines the bound this gh is the uh speed of the uh, square of the speed of the uh, wave that is carrying the information so at the radius the velocity square of the fluid is the same as the um, uh, uh, information carrying uh, wave speed so that is the boundary and then all right so that's the boundary condition now you look at the flow rate which is expressed in terms of the radius the height and the velocity and you look at the travel time and the viscous dissipation time you match the time scales and you get an answer that the radius of where this jump is occurring would be proportional to the flow rate uh, raised to the power 5 8 and uh, inversely proportional to viscosity to the power 3 8 and g of course i mean well that doesn't i mean you don't do this experiment in other g's so the important thing is the q to the power 5 8 divided by eta to the power 3 8 so that actually people can do experiments very easily and find that these are uh, indeed true that radius does follow almost a 5 8 law and uh, inverse 3 8 law for the viscosity so i mean it's once again uh, interesting hydrodyn everyday hydrodynamic phenomenon this is the same thing which you saw for a tap but now done in 2010 uh, by a french group very carefully in a very thick oil which is being poured down from here flowing out and you can see the superb ring that they have made over here and here the flow speed is higher uh, than the wave speed and that should give rise that is like a cherenkov uh, radiation and here you see the experimentalist showing you a cherenkov cone so uh, so all right with, with, uh, with this uh, background 
uh, the IIT Kharagpur uh, mechanical engineering uh, almost now 15 years ago um, uh, did this uh, lovely experiment um, that uh, they had two, they put uh, two sources. Here is one tap, here is the other tap, and this has a local pattern, this has a local pattern, and they brought it close together. So they bring it, they are bringing it close together. You can't go sort of, I mean, up here is fast flowing and then it's slow, fast flowing here is slow and the fast flowings are coming together. And when they come together, they start forming a wall and the wall gets sort of better established as you bring them a little more closer. And here you see the wall uh, very cleanly as uh, they have brought it close together. It's almost static fluid over here, same on the other side. And you see this superb wall over there. And then they became a little more ambitious, brought the two flows a little closer. And now you see the wall collapse. And uh, that is a good point really to end the talk. So that was what you miss. So thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. So I think um, many of the students are really left because, because of the break. Um, so so it's, uh, we are running out of time. So, uh, so one or two quick questions, please. Students, one or two quick questions because it's already 5.16. Or you need some clarifications, students. Prasant, do you have some questions? No, sir. No, sir. Yeah. Please, please. Yeah. Yep. Prasant, uh, can you unmute and talk? Prasant? Uh, yeah. So, okay. uh, and, uh, what is, uh, what's the slide that you wanted to talk about? Uh, what was the question? I, I haven't heard. Uh, Prasant, is, it is better to uh, unmute and talk because chat box is uh, now difficult to. Oh, it's, uh, am I muted? No, 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 sir. Yes. Uh, can you can hear me, right? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he said that there are no questions. There is no questions from the student side. Maybe they will write to you, sir. And <laughs> they are a bit hesitating to ask by directly. Yeah. Uh, okay, Professor, there are no more questions from you. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so, yeah. <laughs> Since there are no more questions, I would like to conclude the session uh, by thanking Professor Patraji for accepting our invitation and giving a very uh, interesting talk on the pattern thank you sir thank you, thank very, you much. very much thank you very much for it i will write to you the other details by email sir okay sure